Do you want to play a game? A game? Yeah, I just got it. I'm super excited. What kind of game? Well, let's just say it's a game of daring, maybe a little bit of danger, definitely suspense and surprise. You like my alliteration there? I do, but I don't know if that's my kind of game. Oh yeah, it is. You definitely want to play. Let's go check it out. Are you sure? Oh yeah. This is the game that I got. This is the game? This is the game, yeah. It says it's a game of daring dentistry. <laughs> I told you it was a game of daring and danger. Wow, you know I, works? I think I can handle this game. I, I knew you could. <laughs> so, so, all you have to do is try to choose a tooth and push it down. And if you get bit, you lose. Okay, who goes first? It doesn't matter. Me? Yeah, ladies first. Okay. You got lucky. I'm gonna go in the front. I'm oddly nervous. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Oh. <laughs> okay, let's go again. Okay. Let's go again. Best two out of three. Really, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All right. So, one more time. Okay. Ladies first. <laughs> ah! Okay. So, <laughs> you win. I win. I got to ask you a question, though. Okay. Did you know that it was likely that you could get bit by the crocodile? Yes. Yeah, I did too. Did you know when it was going to happen? No. No, it, like, it's kind of funny, but <laughs> it's actually for, what is the age? Four and up. Yeah, four years old and up. And I was still like, uh, kind of surprised <laughs> and nervous. It was like I knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know when. But I didn't know when. Yeah. And uh, that actually reminds me of a story that we're going to talk about today. So, remember this. We knew what was coming. We just didn't know when. As we go and we talk about our Bible lesson for today. Okay, so we've been playing this crocodile dentist game, right? And there's a point that I want to tie into today's lesson. From Acts chapter 21, Paul, the apostle, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and something unusual happens whenever he is uh, talking to a prophet named Agabus. So Agabus comes along. This comes from Acts chapter 21, verse 10 and 11, he comes along and he approaches Paul and he takes Paul's belt and he binds his own hands and feet with the belt and he ties himself up. And then he tells Paul, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Then all of the people are saying, Paul, don't go. We don't want you to do this, you know. And, and Paul will not be persuaded. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem knowing what the prophet Agabus said. You're going to be arrested. There's just a question of when. It's sort of like with the crocodile, right? It's a... a I'm nervous again. <laughs> it's a question of when is it going to happen? I don't know. I just know that if I keep pressing these teeth... It's going to happen because that's what's going to happen. I just don't know when. And the same with Paul. It's going to happen. He just doesn't know when. Will it be as soon as he arrives or will it take a little while? He doesn't know. So that gets us into really the story for today. He makes his way to Jerusalem and that's when things start happening. In Jerusalem... There's this accusation against Paul that these Jewish people are starting to believe in Christ and they are zealous for the law. But under Christ, the law is no longer necessary. And so they get frustrated with Paul and they're saying, you're teaching all the people to abandon Moses and all those things that we hold dear. And so Paul, he says, okay, I'm going to go do this Jewish um, purification rite. And he takes a vow that, that's sort of a, a way to say, I'm not condemning those Jewish practices. They're just not necessary under Jesus Christ and, and under the law of Christ anymore. You can do them, but they aren't necessary. They're no longer binding. 
And so he goes and he does this. And that takes us to this point. This, that was from uh, Acts 21, 17 through 36. But I want to read starting in verse 27. I'm sorry, 17 through 26, not 36. Starting in verse 27. Let me read this to you, kind of what happens. So he's just made this vow and he is working on his purification with that vow. So when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They were mad. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander of the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, Get rid of him! That didn't take long. He's already just been there like a week, and they already arrested him. It must have been like the second tooth, right? It already happened. But it's interesting that, that the Jews from Asia, they got so angry so quickly, they saw Paul in the temple, and they made an assumption. It said they assumed that he had brought Trophimus into the temple because Trophimus was an Ephesian. He was not a Jew. He was a Greek. And he was not allowed in the temple because he was a Greek. So this made the Jews mad. Even though Trophimus hadn't actually been in the temple, they accused him of coming into the temple. So, didn't take long. Paul's already arrested just like Agabus said would happen. So at this point, Paul wants to speak to the people. And he tells the soldier, you know, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he asked. And he said, I thought you were this Egyptian who was stirring things up, and a terrorist, you know, in the wilderness. And he says, no. He said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia. And so he, he claims, you know, I'm, I'm not a citizen of any obscure city. Let me speak. So, so he gets permission. He can speak to the people, and they all become silent. He speaks in Aramaic, and they get even more silent. Then he tells them this. I am a Jew to the crowd, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was zealous for God, as many of you are today. He goes on to explain how he persecuted the church and he was going to Damascus with that intent. And then he tells them of his conversion story. And I hope you remember that, how he was on the road and he saw the light and he was blinded and he spoke Jesus to him. Why are you persecuting me? And, and he eventually is converted. He goes and, and sees Damas uh, Ananias. That's the word. <laughs> I mixed Damascus and Ananias. It didn't work. Um, he goes and meets Ananias in, in Damascus, and he baptizes him, and he, he's converted, and then he begins preaching. And so he, he speaks about this idea that, that I now have changed basically sides. I'm, I'm no longer in league with the Jews. I'm now in league with the Christians. I have, I've been converted. I've changed my mind. And so they, they get angry, very much so. They want to kill him. Pretty intense. But let, let me ask you, why do you think he told them about his lineage? I'm a Jew and about his teacher, Gamaliel. Why would he have done that? 
I think he needed to remind them where he came from, and particularly, this, this would help the people remember, he was somebody that was strict in following the Jewish customs and laws, and that might help the people listen to his story and, and help him to be able to persuade them to follow Jesus too. So then I want to read what happens here. This is important. This is Acts 22, 22 through 29. He just told them, I will, I will send you away to go speak to the Gentiles. That's what God told him to do. And then the crowd responds. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this about going to the Gentiles. Then they raised their voices and they shouted, Rid him of, from the earth. He is not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged. Being flogged is very brutal. You get beaten severely and it's very painful. So he directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked, This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So why was it that the crowd wanted to kill Paul? I want you to think about that for just a minute. Why did this crowd of Jews think they needed to kill Paul? And then we'll come back and talk some more. As far as I can tell, they believed that Paul was speaking blasphemy. And according to Jewish law, that was punishable by death. Look, this is from Leviticus 24, verse 16. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them, whether foreign or native-born. When they blaspheme the name, they are to be put to death. So they... I think, believed that Paul was guilty of blasphemy. And that's why they wanted to kill him. Because it was in accordance with the law of God. But I think they were wrong. They just didn't know it. So it's at this point that Paul chooses to bring up his citizenship as a Roman. This allowed him to escape being flogged. And it brings up something that's very important. Citizenship. The centurion in this story, he says, I had to pay a big sum of money for my citizenship. And Paul says, I was born as a citizen. And I think it's, it's worth noting that he said it was very expensive to get to be a Roman citizen. And we, we get to be citizens of God's kingdom at a very, very high price. The price of the blood of Jesus, the only Son of God. But even though it costs such a high price, we can have it for free if there's a condition to it, right? If we choose to accept that gift and we obey God through baptism, confession of Jesus, and living a life faithfully. So because of Paul's citizenship, the Romans were like, we're not going to do this. We're going to send you back. And so in Acts chapter 22, 30 through 23, 11... There is an important piece of this where um, Paul is before the Sanhedrin and he's telling them who he is and, and there's this, this kind of altercation that happens and he realizes part of the Sanhedrin is Pharisees and part of the Sanhedrin is Sadducees. And he says, I, I am a Pharisee and it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead, more or less, that I am on trial today. So, 
that causes a debate to arise between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. My question is, once he perceives that, why does he mention this resurrection of the dead? Why would he do that? Do you, do you know? Well, I, there, was, there was a story back from the Gospels. This comes from Mark chapter 12, verse 18 through 23, whenever there were Sadducees that came to Jesus to test him, and they asked him a question about seven brothers. And they said there were seven brothers. One married a woman and didn't have children, so the second married didn't have children, all the way down through the seven brothers, no children. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And he explains, you know, you've got this wrong. Uh, we're never given in marriage in, in, in the, the resurrection. That's not how this works. You're badly mistaken. So, in that story, we learn that the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. But the Pharisees, they do believe in the resurrection. So he sets up this debate between the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, a debate that had likely happened many, many, many times before, and their di disagreement gets to be so sharp that they basically dismiss Paul, and the Romans step back in one more time, and they, they send Paul back to the barracks. And so this, this is what happens next in verse uh, chapter 23, verse 12 through 22. The next morning... Some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. That's pretty serious. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. So they, they speak about this. The son of Paul's sister, his nephew, he heard this and he goes and tells Paul, and so Paul says, take this young man to uh, the commander. And the commander gets to hear what he says. So the little boy tells him, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in an ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone what you have reported to me. So what did these men vow to do? Forty of them, maybe even a few more. They vowed that they were going to kill Paul before they had anything to eat or drink. That means very soon. So who heard it? It was Paul's nephew. And what did he do? He went to go speak to Paul, and then Paul sent him to the commander. And that way, the commander says, don't tell anybody that you told this to me. So what's going to happen? Will they get Paul before they starve themselves to death? They said they wouldn't eat or drink until they gotten it done. Well, you're going to have to come back on Wednesday to find out. So... I'll see you on Wednesday, and I look forward to it.